Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're, as I said, in the middle of a a sermon series called Conversations with John. While Matthew, Mark, and Luke focus more on, on action and drama, John spills a lot more ink relating in depth conversations that Jesus has with those around him. Uh, Today, we're looking at the conversation between Jesus and Mary Magdalene when she sees her risen Lord for the first time. Well, John also tends to focus on signs over and above miracles. Uh, a, A miracle is something beyond what could normally happen. It is unexpected and uh, unlooked for, spectacular even. Miracles, they grab your attention. On the other hand, a sign is something that points beyond itself. A sign could be something quite ordinary. In John's gospel, specific objects or events are often used to point out something important. Normal things like water, bread, or light. The sign is less important than what it points to or what it points out to you. For instance, you know, think of an interstate sign. The interstate sign might tell you what exit you need or what food is there. But think about it. More importantly and more tasty than the sign itself is the skyline chili and cheese that it points you towards. Well, John's gospel gives us lots of signs, and although none of them point to Skyline Chili, they are nonetheless important. And they are, similarly, signs that are not just there for us to see and say, oh, look, there's a sign, that's nice. No, but so that we can react the right way. Now, if we do what, if we ignore what they tell us to do, or where we ought to look, we might as well have not seen them in the first place. Which brings us to Mary Magdalene. John hones in on Mary Magdalene's conversation with Jesus so that we too might respond in the right way, by faith and following Jesus' instructions. Now at first glance, Mary Magdalene seems quite ordinary or unimpressive to the world but she's actually one of the most important and pivotal people in all of the New Testament. Mary Magdalene is one of, if not the very first person to see the resurrected Christ. And she's very helpful for us because she shows us how to respond to Jesus's resurrection. Now, at first, Mary Magdalene sees all the signs, but she doesn't properly understand them or or properly understand or respond to the signs. She sees the empty tomb right away, uh, but she reacts with panic and confusion. Uh, She tells Peter and John, and Peter and John run to the tomb. Peter and John get there, but they don't get it. Or, Or at the very least, they don't explain anything to poor Mary, who's left standing there. I wonder if they said anything at all to her as they passed by her, or if they just walked past her with dazed expressions on their faces. Now, uh, Mary has probably barely been keeping it together up until this point. Uh, Things have been bad enough, and she was here to do one last loving act for her Lord, and now she can't even do that. Mary is probably completely losing it at this point, and she's crying. The first thing she sees as she peers into the tomb Uh, through blurry images of tears, are angelic beings. But she doesn't recognize them as angels. At least it certainly doesn't look like it. And think about it. She can barely think or see straight um, at this point. These figures, though, they ask her, Woman, why are you weeping? Now, Mary replies, They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have laid him. She still obviously thinks that that Jesus is permanently dead, which it's hard to blame her because that's what dead usually means. 
but she turns away from them. Perhaps she just wants to avoid any more stupid men who have been practically of no help to her at all. But through beleaguered eyes, and she sees yet one more figure. And he says to her as well, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Uh, assuming he's the caretaker of the graveyard, she asks, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where have you, you have laid him, and I will go and take him away. Apparently, Mary is, I don't know how else to take this, she's apparently planning on carrying or dragging the body of Jesus by herself somewhere else. Maybe she's worried that the, there's some sort of problem, the plot is not paid for or some other problem arisen, but whatever it is, she will not willingly leave her Lord to the elements and the animals. She may break her back, become ceremonially unclean for sure, or sick herself possibly, but she will do whatever she can to honor him. But then Jesus calls her by name, Mary. I could be wrong, but I imagine Mary shrieking out, Rabboni, uh, Jesus, perhaps gently removing her hands from around him, then tells her, do not cling to me. For basically, it's not over yet. You have a job to do. Go and tell my brothers and say to them, I must ascend to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Well, now Mary sees and she has faith and follows her Lord's instructions. You know, it, it doesn't really matter that you are here for Easter. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I am glad that everybody is here for Easter. Uh, uh, it's now that you're here, you can respond and, and, and listen to the Lord. Um, but here's the question. You are hearing the good news, but will you have faith? and follow, because that's what matters. And the right way to respond to Easter is to have faith and to follow our Lord. Now, we rejoice, certainly. We rejoice practically spontaneously because, I mean, seriously, death is dead. Death is swallowed up in victory. This type of resurrection is, has never happened before in the whole history of the world. Well, you better believe we're going to be saying some hallelujahs. If you actually believe the fantastic Easter account is real, you can't help yourself. You will rejoice. Like Jesus comforting Mary, Jesus gives us um, uh, immeasurable comfort and consolation at Easter. Uh, seeing our Savior defeating death on the other side of the grave is our great hope, the only hope we have of outlasting death. And so we rejoice and we sing practically out of reflex because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. However, that's not really the conscious response that John and that our Lord and Savior is looking for in our text from you today. Jesus wanted Mary to have faith and follow him. Jesus wants you to have faith and follow him as well. Um, simply witnessing Easter uh, counts for nothing, right? I mean, think about it. The soldiers, they saw the angels and they were scared spitless because they were on the wrong side. The chief priests saw the empty tomb and how did they respond? They plotted because it was inconvenient and incompatible with their plans for power and control. So they didn't accept it. They plotted against it. Simply seeing or hearing Easter or even coming to church doesn't mean squat. What matters is faith and following Christ. Jesus is warning us today. He doesn't want us to stall or to stop on Easter morning or stall at singing. God would have, uh, he wants us to follow him. Jesus says, rather go to my brothers and say to them, I am a, I, oops, I might need you to go back. 
I don't know what I, I went too far forward. Um, Jesus, uh, Jesus, rather, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Like many of Jesus' words in John, this is sort of a puzzling statement. I mean, why should Mary stop holding on to Jesus? I mean, what's more important than Jesus being alive? Well, Jesus tells Mary not to hold on to him because his resurrection is not a standalone event. The resurrection itself is a sign. It's pointing to something else. Remember, that's what a sign does. It points us to something else, and in John's gospel in particular. And Jesus is pointing, I must go to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Jesus' resurrection is a sign first, among several things, that the Father of Jesus is your Father as well. God wants to call you and me his kids. The resurrection is a sign to us of God's plans for we who follow in Jesus' footsteps. God would have been within his rights, if you think about it, to be irate about how the world crucified his son. I mean, how would most fathers react? After all, we look at our own lives and our own mistakes and how we've sometimes treated his commands and guidance and gifts. At times, we've ignored them. Other times, we've undermined them. Or we've even rebelled against God's guidance and word in our lives. And even if we don't fully realize it, the truth is our rejection of God's rules, of his guidance, has led to the rejection and crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus' death was unfair, a, a heinous crime against humanity. For that matter, it was a heinous crime against God himself. And yet, God, shockingly, chose to react to the cross and to the death of his only son with mercy and forgiveness. God decided. He didn't have to. Your father loved you, and he decided to view Jesus' death as a way of reconciling, as a means of atonement. Uh, the cross of Jesus was sort of like God laying down his arms and saying, I'm just going to let you hit me and rage against me. And once you've exhausted yourselves and come to your senses, you'll see, I'm still here. I still love you. You're killing me with all this sin and this hate and this bitterness but you're not stopping me. I'm still your God, and I'm still your Father. So, what do we do now? Well, of course, we're going to sing some more songs. We're going to remember Jesus' death and, and the salvation he purchased and won for us as we take the Lord's Supper, and, and we're connected to his death through this meal. These things will help us do the most important thing of all. Having seen the sign of of Jesus' resurrection, we will have faith in Christ's saving work and follow our Savior from this day forth. In Jesus' name, amen.